Minister Polak, thanks for joining us here today on Regulator Watch. Glad to be here. You just finished speaking at the BC LNG conference. What was your key message about LNG to the delegates and that you want the rest of British Columbia to hear? The interrelated nature of the economy, the environment and energy. It's not good enough just to focus on the environment or just to focus on the economy and energy. Is that how the government has approached this? We always have to look at saying yes to the environment, uh, but at the same time saying yes to the economy and saying yes to energy. That becomes even more important around the world. I just came back from Peru and the international discussions with the World Bank, with the International Monetary Fund, uh, when they're talking about climate action, they're talking about how to do that in a context where there are millions of people around the world who want more energy, need more energy to lift them out of poverty. Um, right now in India, they're busy constructing coal plants. As that middle class grows, we're hoping to see that natural gas can replace what would have ordinarily been new coal plants being built in places around the world as they seek to develop their economies. Is it fair to say we have a moral obligation to provide energy to the world? Ask any world leader, they would tell you that you do. When you look at, uh, well, for example, use India again. Um, you have there uh, a society that is trying very hard to lift people out of poverty. Poverty that is beyond anything that we see here in Canada, as bad as some of our situations are. Uh, the only way that happens is if these people have access to energy. The next question for the world is what kind of energy is that going to be? If we can be an exporter of what will be the cleanest natural gas, liquefied natural gas production in the world, uh, then we have just had a positive impact on the world stage. Uh, India is one example, but they're all around the world. Countries where they are reliant on coal and diesel for their power and they are decades away from viable renewables. There is only, only one real answer right now. So Minister Pollock, one of the key uh, regulators that RegWatch covers for the province of British Columbia is the BC Environmental Assessment Office, and obviously under your purview. Can you tell our viewers, what is it that the BCEAO does? What are some of the big challenges? First thing to remember is that if you can't grow it, you have to get it out of the ground. That means that for all of the everyday items that we use uh, as we get up in the morning and go about our lives, um, you have an impact on the environment. Having a mine that digs out the elements that are part of your smartphone, um, having an oil and gas plant that is going to provide some of the petrochemicals that are used in the healthcare industry. All of these things have an impact on the environment. What we do at the Environmental Assessment Office is evaluate what that impact might be. We propose mitigations, we require uh, those companies, those proponents to take steps to reduce the impact that they're going to have from their operation, whether it's mining, oil and gas, or what have you. Uh, those requirements then form their environmental certificate. So when they go and build their project, these are legally binding requirements, conditions, as we call them, under which they can construct that, uh, that project. It, it does not happen without them meeting those conditions. So let me ask you, some critics, uh, and there are a few, of the BC environmental assessment process, they say that it's not particularly onerous for a proponent and it's a kind of a rubber stamp, at least that's the criticism. Well, I guess I would challenge any of uh, those who have that critique to take a look on the website at the vast number of pages involved in a typical environmental assessment. The most common complaint that I hear these days with respect to the environmental assessment process is not that it's not onerous enough. It's from community members, First Nations, who find that there is just far too much information to wade through in a short period of time. So we're doing our best to not only be transparent with all of that documentation, but now we're trying to find ways that we can summarize some of that information for communities who don't necessarily have the technical expertise so they can understand some of the things we're wrestling with and provide some, uh, some input and some opinion on those projects. When you say opinion, does that not provide a danger maybe because in the summarization process you might put a little bit of a, a, a touch or a feel to it that might be seen to be obviously 
in support? It's why we have resisted doing that up until this point. And as I say, we're not going to stop putting out all the technical details, uh, all of the documentation that's submitted by proponents. It's currently all up on our website. People have access to all of it. We'll continue to do that. First Nations are beginning to take an active role in the evaluation of projects, you know, so by conducting their own independent environmental st impact studies. Now, last week, the Squamish Nation announced that it conducted a review, of course, of the $1.6 billion wood fiber LNG project, and it approved uh, that project. The release said that it was a legally binding um, environmental certificate being issued by the Squamish, Na Squamish Nation. What does that mean? What does legally binding mean in this case? Well, my understanding of this particular approval by the Squamish is that this will now form an agreement that they will execute with the proponents for the project. So as I understand it, that would be how they achieve uh, a legally binding circumstance with respect to it. Uh, but it's a, it's a fascinating study in how the Squamish approached it. Uh, very many times we hear First Nations attitudes portrayed as being in uh, nothing but opposition to these kinds of developments. And what I would say in my experience, and I've been Aboriginal Relations Minister in the past, my experience is not that there's uh, simply opposition everywhere, that nine times out of 10, there's a need to have involvement, understanding, feel that there's been meaningful input received, uh, that their concerns have been addressed. And I think what the Squamish Nation did here was afford that opportunity to their uh, people, their members of their First Nation, so that they could actually feel as though they'd been meaningfully involved in the process, had their concerns addressed. Uh, it certainly is, I think, a very positive move on the part of Squamish to take that on themselves. We're always looking in the Environmental Assessment Office for ways in which we can more meaningfully involve First Nations. Does it not undermine, though, some of the authority of the office and the government's role to regulate? I don't think it has to. Um, in, interestingly enough, when one looks at the conditions that the Squamish First Nation have placed in their assessment report, and ours uh, at the provincial level is not complete yet, uh, but knowing what our uh, executive director has looked at in the environmental assessment process, I see a lot of similarities with respect to the Squamish process and the kinds of mitigations that they have required and the conditions they've placed. Having it more formalized like this, I think, has a lot of potential to enhance the process that we already engage in. Does this third party independent environmental review process by First Nation in a way help solve the dilemma of social license? Well, I think too, we talk about social license and very often what we are really describing is a need for trust. People want to trust that a process has been fair, that it has been open, that it has been rigorous. So I, I think when we talk about social license, it really is for governments, whether they're First Nations governments, provincial governments, we're trying to find ways to build that trust in the community. That takes information. It takes the uh, ability to have a conversation where people feel that they're heard. Um, the challenge is that hearing someone doesn't necessarily mean doing exactly what they say. So in some cases, for example, uh, a a community's input on a project might not sink the project, but it might substantially affect the way the project looks. There's also the challenge we have in trying to describe what an environmental assessment certificate is. I, I often say to my staff, I wish we called it something else, because the language, when we say it's an environmental assessment certificate, I think that word certificate makes most everyday people think of uh, a carte blanche. Here's your certificate, go off, build your project, you're done. Instead, it might be more accurate to call it a list of environmental requirements. Because truly, what you see is a project, first of all, very few of them at the end of the process look like the project that came in the front end. Very iterative, the project tends to change as there's feedback from the office saying, don't do that, why don't you try this, this might be better. Uh, the projects typically change as they go through the process. And then, of course, if they don't meet the requirements as they go to permitting, 
then that project is not going to move forward. And so that give and take is really important for people to understand. It's not just a rubber stamp and then they're off along their way. Yeah, it, you, you do not, uh, in my experience, I, I have not yet been faced with, uh, here's the project, it's yes or no. What you receive is, here's a project, if they do it this way, it could be done safely. And so you place those requirements on uh, to make sure that something can be done safely. We also screen a lot of projects out at the very beginning. Mm -hmm. We have a 180 day evaluation process, but prior to that we have a stage whereby we are checking the requirements that we know we will need, the information, the material, the documentation that we know we're going to need throughout the process. If we don't see within that screening process, if we don't see that the company, the proponents can provide us uh, with that complete application, then we don't move to the formal review of the 180 days. We send them back to the start uh, to get better prepared to enter the process. So that's another aspect that people don't necessarily see is that while uh, they might not see a lot of uh, uh, no's at the end of the process, there are a lot of no's at the beginning of the process where somebody doesn't even make it into the review. Do you see hope for projects getting the green light in BC or is it only going to get more contentious? I think that's a, it's a difficult question to answer. I think a lot of that is going to depend on how involved we can make the communities, the First Nations, who are confronted by these projects. So you're never going to find the perfect project. You're never going to find a project that has no impact on the environment. What you have to ask and what we hope to do in the Environmental Assessment Office is ensure that that impact is as minimal as possible.